Me- meaning we need all we, we need alternative non-commercial authorities to start doing clinical trials. Absolutely, absolutely, and we need total objectivity. Uh, look, I, I've often said, and I'm sure I've said it uh, on your program, John, is that there, there was no basis for needing to use genetic vaccines. Uh, there, no one has ever demonstrated a genetic vaccine is any better than a good old-fashioned um, uh, crushed-up virus, if you like. But um, they've got so many downsides, the side effects, the uncontrolled antigen dosage, um, the impaired response to repeated vaccine because of tolerance. I mean, so many problems. And yet here we are developing factories and all of these things. Uh, it, it, there's very little sense and logic in all of this. It really doesn't make any sense medically to me at all. And I think there's been certainly... Even in even in the sort of latter stages of, of uh, my, my career, Robert, and, and I know you're st- still working, there's been there's been a definite change in whole attitudes to treatment and therapeutics, really. And I think this change has been accelerating over the last sort of ten, twenty years. What's your sort of take on that? Well, I've always um, acted as a, a physician on the basis. Of, of two guiding principles. The first is the integrity of the doctor-patient relationship. And that basically means that um, as, as a physician, I'd sit down with a patient, I'd discuss what's happening, I'd do various treatment options, upside, downside for various things, and collectively we make a decision. Yeah. Now, that has gone completely out the window. Uh, I, I think you're right. I think it's been creeping in and maybe I didn't notice it till the uh, COVID pandemic came. But certainly with COVID, Suddenly, I'm being told, and my patients are being told, that this is how things are going to be treated. I mean, for, what, over a year, we were saying to patients, stay at home till you get really sick and you can't breathe, and then come into the hospital. And then we haven't got too much we can do for you. I mean, that's how, for the first time in in 50 years of practice, uh, I I was faced uh, with with that type of scenario. Now, the doctor-patient relationship... Um, then became very distorted by all sorts of uh, misinformation uh, that was appearing on the TV every night, uh, disinformation, all sorts of new, new, new terms are being used. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, we weren't being told the truth. And um, the, the, the truth was there. Uh, the, the truth about vaccines was there before we even started. We knew they weren't going to work very well. Um, we knew that they were liable to... Uh, side effects. And, and I'm not particularly smart, but I, I wrote about this in January, the end of 2020, uh, just because, I, you know, physiologically the, that was going to happen. And so the doctor-patient relationship became very fractured. And, and now with what's going on, where we're moving the decision-making uh, from the politics in a country to an unelected body in the World Health Organization, um, that relationship uh, is at risk of ever being repaired. And on this, the other hand, uh, the, the second of my guiding principles was uh, the science base, basis of medicine, that there's a logic and uh, a science to medicine. And that's not just about randomised controlled trials because the reality is a patient with a particular condition is always a little bit different to somebody who, uh, to the average in a controlled trial, to what you see in a textbook. Um, I I wish it was as easy as the textbooks try to make it. But every patient is different. Every patient, as you uh, certainly know, John, uh, has different uh, conditioning factors, um, different backgrounds, different medications they're on, um, different strategies in how they handle life. And so um, very often good medicine is looking at the process of disease. That certainly applies uh, in my patients with immunological diseases because no one's done randomised controlled trials on often the rare diseases that one sees and you have to sit and work your way through what you think makes logical sense. Now, you, you couldn't do that uh, with uh, with COVID because um, that whole rational process was taken away from the doctor. And so you, you not only destroyed the doctor-patient relationship, but you also... Um, destroyed the science basis because other people were giving their opinions which were not always based on science but often influenced by uh, political and economic issues which we we know about 
So basically it's medicine dictated by guidelines. But it's more than guidelines. It, it, it's dictates really. And it's almost like you've got international and national bodies telling you at the local level what is right for your patients. So instead of you deciding on an individual basis what is right, large international bodies say, well, this is the way everyone's going to be treated. I mean, that's a complete reversal of the individualization of patient care, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And I think uh, some time ago uh, we talked about um, the, uh, the idea of best, best medical practice and, and how it, it's constituted by three different uh, platforms. So there's the, uh, the evidence that a particular therapy is going to work. Um, there's the expectation um, of, of the patient. And um, there's the, uh, the, the science uh, behind uh, what, what, what is happening. And so um, what, what, that is the way in which I certainly look at what I call the, the science base of medicine. And that involves very much uh, the patient's input. And I think patients, I get the feeling, are very, very disappointed uh, with my profession at the moment. Um, uh, they tell me that uh, th this is so. Uh, they can't, don't know who to trust. Uh, the, the patients, I always work on the basis, every patient is smarter than I am. And, and, and so I listen to what they say to me. And uh, what they've been saying in the last year or so uh, is concerning, very concerning. Where do we go from this, Robert? What, what, what do we learn? I mean, it just seems to me that the World Health Organization now, they're trying to interview, introduce these international health regulations, which seems dictatorial to me to the point of absurdity. Uh, it, things seem to be getting worse. Where, what, what have we learned and, and, and where, what the heck do we do now? Well, very good question. Uh, I think that's exactly what we're looking at. There's a, a series of very important uh, decisions to be made over the next uh, eight or nine months. Uh, and if those decisions go the wrong way, uh, you're going to have uh, the WHO deciding what is a pandemic or uh, when they should be involved, uh, deciding on what treatment uh, where, where to use and the treatment in Nigeria or the treatment in Egypt, the treatment in Australia, the treatment in England. Every country Every country is different. They have different infrastructures and how uh, and strategies, uh, and of course, disease can be modulated in different climates in different areas. And so, there's no such thing as one size fits all um, to start with. Uh, and uh, it's it, and of course, the influence on the WHO by political and uh, economic uh, uh, components is very strong. We know that. Uh, we know that. And uh, certainly, if we look at the track record through uh, COVID, the WHO's performance was appalling. Uh, it was appalling. Um, they, um, they held back uh, and downgraded the use of, of effective, cheap treatments. Um, they, uh, uh, they promoted um, a, a number of uh, public health uh, issues that uh, have subsequently been shown to have been uh, uh, ill-advised. And, and the list goes on. Mm. Now, um, I'm not currently in clinical practice. I'm hoping to get back to it pr pretty soon. But I if I couldn't, um, it wouldn't be a total disaster for me because I've already got my occupational pension from years <laughs> in education. And um, I suspect you're probably at a similar stage <laughs> in your career, although you're doing more clinical work than me. But you and me, Robert, we've got I, mutual I, I, friends. I, I, yeah, we've got yeah. mutual friends who we know who are still young and in practice. Yeah. Now, we are relatively, relatively freer to speak out than the, the, the clinical colleagues. Do you think this indicates that there's, I don't know, almost widespread intimidation amongst uh, practicing staff at the moment, that there's, sim there's simply areas they know they can't go to? Look, I've thought about this, as you have, John, uh, a lot, and I, I just don't know the answer. I think it's a combination. Um, if... If you think about it, um, doctors uh, are taught as uh, students, they're taught as trainee doctors, um, and, and they're in what we call you know, self-learning and um, maintaining our, our skill sets. Uh, but, and we, we, we get to believe what people tell us. Um, and, and what has happened, I think, in medicine is that 
the, the trickle-down uh, senior physician uh, leadership has been replaced by the more politicised public uh, statements. Uh, and I, I think doctors um, are, are, are confused. I, I talk to friends who are general practitioners and a number of them have said, you know, we don't know what to do. We're, we're not getting the advice from anybody now. We're, we're just reading about it in the, on the news and in, in the newspapers. So I, I think there's a breakdown, and this is going to become a lot worse if we further remove the, um, the information streams uh, to uh, some international body which is unelected and which is highly uh, uh, corruptible. Mm -hmm. I think the main change in my thinking in this, Robert, is that throughout all my entire career, basically I've done what I was told you have to do. So, uh, you know, w w when, I, when I was a young staff nurse, the consultant would say something. That's right. And, 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 and boy, that, 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 was, that, that was from Mount Olympus. You know, that, that, was, that was it. You, you did exactly as you were told. You, you lived in fear. <laughs> no, no, I would say more respect. Yes. Oh, well, we lived in fear and respect. Yeah, well, but there was fear as well, of course. F fear came more from the Ward sisters, from the, from the consultants. But, but um, th there was a hierarchy. You did what you were told. But, but those consultants were making decisions based on their, their medical opinions, really. And then as time gone on, it has gone on, we've got more and more guidelines and you have to do what the guidelines say. So towards the end of my teaching career, a lot of it was teaching what national guidelines are saying because you can't contradict those. And most of them seemed eminently sensible. So you, you, you tend to go with those. So we, we've always had this sort of deference to authority, really, in healthcare. And then when COVID came along, the, the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer were saying various things. The national guidelines were saying various things. And because this is what you've done all your life, you've just basically complied all your life. Uh, this is what I, I carried on doing. And now, because of the faults that were in what the chief medical officer said, the chief scientific officer said, all these, all these guidelines, the faults that were in those has basically destroyed my trust of authority completely. And, um, you know, even doctors I've worked with recently, they're just going by guidelines rather than going by their own opinions. And I think this combination of um, having to apply to guidelines, the, the threat of sanction, and the, the, the collapse in, in my belief in authority has really changed my outlook completely. Uh, do, do you, have you had a similar disillusionment, shall we say? Well, well I think guidelines are very interesting. I, guidelines have been around for a long time. And the guidelines that... And they, they've been very, very valuable. And of course. we've all used them. Uh, no course. question. But of it's a question of, of how the guidelines are determined. Uh, you're quite right. The guidelines that we had uh, in, in, for years and years, uh, as a, 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 an intern, a specialist physician, um, I would be uh, treating patients with, uh, um, say, something I, I didn't see every day, heart failure or something, and I use guidelines. And those guidelines came from my, my peers um, who were the senior cardiologists, uh, the very senior people who are running the exams for uh, internal medicine, uh, and and that's the guidelines were really good, really good, and and then uh, not all based on on, on the so-called randomised controlled trial, which has become a tool more of the pharmaceutical company, and yeah. only about twenty percent of the drugs we use every day uh, have actually ever been subjected to a randomised controlled trial. So let's get that one out of the way. But yeah. but that was based on good scientific evidence. Um, now, I, I think that with co that's been shifting uh, and a, a political component ha has come into this and an economic component and big pharma influence component. And I think with COVID, it's come as a great shock. It, 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 there may have well have been, and I agree with you, there have been sl subtle changes which we probably didn't notice before. Uh, and suddenly they've, been, they've hit us with COVID because uh, the two big areas have been so completely politicised um, and and scandalously so. Um, that is the early treatment, which could have saved numerous lives in all our countries, uh, and vaccines, uh, which we have not been told the truth about. Um, and, uh, and suddenly, it, it's pretty obvious when you, you, you find that nearly everyone in hospital who's uh, uh, very sick has had four or five or six 
uh, vaccines. Now, you know, how, how many vaccines have you got to have? Um, and if you understand what's happening, you, you wouldn't have had all those. But anyway, it's another story. But, mm. but I, think, I think that, that um, the, the guidelines have got different origins now and have different intent. And if we go the WHO route, um, we're, we're, we're taking away the, the specialist input even further. And the individualised patient care and the, and the individualised and the assessment. Patient, the doctor-patient relationship, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, we've identified some uh, issues there, Robert. Um, I'm not quite sure we've come on to definitive answers. I think that's probably largely because the definitive answers are outside the range of the individual clinician. These individual answers are, are with international and national power control structures, which to some extent have been usurped. Well, I'll, I'll say one thing uh, in favour of uh, our TGA in Australia. Both now can be uh, prescribed by every doctor in the country. Uh, mind you, it hasn't been well advertised, so I'm doing it for them. But um, um, every doctor in Australia can write a prescription. I think it's every state. Um, and provide for their patients uh, a five-day course. Um, uh, they get 100 tablets, so it can last for the whole family. Um, uh, it, it's a referral to Canberra, but still you can prescribe it. Well, at least that's come in time for the end of the uh, the pandemic, Robert. Well, we're still getting a lot of patients here. Mm. Yeah. So d d just a slightly separate topic. Is COVID still making people ill or is it just triggering comorbidities now? Uh, my take is, I think, um, e ever since we moved into the Omicron uh, phase, and we're getting you know, all these variants downstream now, um, we're getting a lot of cases. Uh, I'm friends of mine, have nearly always, always there's someone I know who, who, who's just had or got um, COVID, um, but we're, we're still getting significant numbers of deaths. I haven't looked in the last few days, but you know, yeah. 20 or 30 deaths a day. But of course, the numbers are so much greater. And so the mortality uh, is, is much less than it was. And, and I think it's fair to say that um, the older, higher risk patients uh, are probably getting Paxlovid, which, which does help, uh, you know, at $1,000, of course. Uh, a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and certainly a lot now also getting and and when I or I hope they are, um, combined with, uh, you know, some zinc and, and uh, um, doxycycline. Yeah. So some patients are still getting like an acute respiratory distress syndrome as a result of coronavirus infection. Yes, some are, some are, certainly, certainly, certainly. And some yeah. are dying. Yeah. Well, thank you, Robert, as always. Again, we could have mentioned uh, zinc and other medications, um, other things that go with it, but I think we've covered quite a lot of material there. And well, thanks, uh, thanks very much for, for, for really being a, a pioneer and a flag fire for... For, for good good quality medicine. Well, no, no, thank you for coming on. I mean, having people of your uh, le level of experience, Robert, is just uh, is what is why people come to this. Is why people watch. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's as good as we. It's as close as we get to definitive uh, medical opinions, which is exactly what we want to hear. So, we we, we appreciate that. Thank you. And um, and we'll. I'm sorry, my mind's just afloat with so many questions now, <laughs> so many things that we've, uh, so many things that we've uh, raised that we haven't got answers to. But I suspect that people might comment on that, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing how this video is received. So, as always, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, John.